<clears throat> okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at all of these different arm structures. I've got the module up on my other screen just so I can get the names of the things that I forget. Um, that nodule that we were talking about at the back of the ulna, that's olecranon, but I don't remember ever being taught that or having to name it, so I'm not going to make you guys name that. But that was the bit that we were talking about. And here are the two sides of the humerus that we were talking about. So keep in mind, none of that is trochanter. That's hip bone. Okay. But I'm going to have that up on my screen for just names and terminology. And then I've got a collection of different pictures of athletes, bodybuilders, um, etc. for good arm poses that we can look at uh, after we take a look at the basic muscular structures, which I've got up here now. So these are all the muscle groups that we are responsible for, this time listed out by section. So the top section here is the incoming section. So the ones that are coming from the, the trunk of the body or from the shoulder area and then combining into the arm structure. Then we've got the pink, which is the upper arm section. So that would be bicep, tricep, and brachialis and then forearm structures, which are brachioradialis, extensors, flexors, and the pronator teres. And I'll point to all of these as we look. Um, I can shut off all of that stuff just momentarily to take a look at these people a little bit more clearly. <clears throat> In general, we're just gonna be drawing tubes, right? When we start drawing these, these arms to just think of them as a big cylinder each time. Uh, Depending on how much muscular development there is, you may want to draw more mass to your cylinder or less, but just keep in mind that there's only a set amount of mass that any person has and you don't want to exceed that. So if you made a very, very big cylinder like this, then it's gonna be a little bit hard to add additional structure on top of that. So I wouldn't go too big, even when they have a lot of muscular development like this guy. Pretty much start with your basic cylinder shapes, get your direction and length, um, figure out foreshortening, if there's a lot of foreshortening or if there's a little, and then where do the muscular structures sit on top of those structures and bulge out from the basic cylindrical shape. So in this case, we've got the bicep, which is actually going somewhere over here to the opposite bone because it has to attach on. You may see some little indications that that's the direction that it's going but generally that's the, the kind of lump shape that we've got there trying to make that sit on top of this cylinder is a lot of the task of making constructive figures okay so that's the basic kind of approach that we're looking for let's go ahead and take a look at the muscle structures since we can see them so clearly on these two okay so here we've got them all blocked in and i'll start with the ones that are um, from the trunk and move my way down the arm towards the wrist. Unfortunately, this guy, he's got his hand hidden back here, but I've roughed it in anyway just to try to get an idea of where it would be laying. Uh, let me turn this down just a little bit. Oh. <clears throat> All right. So starting on the front, since we're looking at the front of his torso, I've drawn in the basic egg shape of the torso here, shown where the rib, um, rib cage is going to sit and then put in the sternum as well as the suprasternal notch and the clavicles. Um, the clavicles do some interesting stuff when you're bending over or rotating, I found. I never really realized how much they rotate, but it's quite a lot. And so sometimes it can invert the shape of the clavicle depending on how you're looking. So it could go up over or it could go straight over in some cases, or in this case, it's going over then up. Um, that's all kind of depending on the rotation. So keep an eye on it. Um, in general, the start and end of the clavicles almost always line up. So these two parts are gonna be parallel regardless of what's happening in the middle. It's just that you might have it going this direction with these two parts parallel, or you might have it going in the opposite direction with those two parts parallel. Just keep an eye on it. In general, it's always gonna stick upward, right, in a sort of V, but just make sure that you're observing whenever you're looking at a figure to see if there's any strong rotation there. Um, so we've got the pecs that attach via the sternum, the first, two thirds of the clavicle and a little bit going along the rib cage. And then they head into the armpit area on the front and generally twist before attaching to the femur, okay? 
So pecs are included because they are um, contributing to the front of the armpit shape and also combining right next to the deltoids um, to create the shoulder overall shoulder shape. So we can see on both the left and right, so here the pecs are going up and diving underneath all these structures contributing to the armpit shape. And up on the top, probably shouldn't have drawn them all the way up to here. They'd probably stop connecting around this area or so, but diving down and attaching to the humerus underneath these muscle structures. Okay. On the back, we're gonna have latissimus. And depending on angle, I think we can see it much more on her. We've got latissimus left and right with pecs in the front here. Um, latissimus is going to create the back portion of the armpit shape. Uh, the middle might be filled in with fat or skin, or it might be really concave the way that it is on her, but it's not unusual to have something sticking out in the middle here, which is usually just kind of loose fat and skin. Um, but there shouldn't be any strong muscular structures down inside of there. In fact, it can really, really be painful or damaging to be jabbed in the armpit specifically, because there's not a whole lot to protect you in there. Okay. So we got latissimus coming up from the back, flaring out and attaching to the humerus as well, at least on the sides it is. Okay. And we can sometimes see it um, the trapezius up here behind the deltoids as well, um, contributing to some of the back shape, although I didn't list that one. It's not specifically interacting with the arm. Okay, So the first muscle structure that we are not familiar with then would be the deltoid. Okay, Deltoid spelled like this. Okay? And those are the big triangular uh, muscles that are on the uppermost extent of the, of the upper arm. So right here. You can think of these as a shield or um, a badge sort of thing. Let me find a place to draw. So kind of a rounded triangular shape like this. And they do have three heads. The middle head goes up a little bit higher like that oftentimes. Sometimes this is connecting around the clavicle. Um, sometimes you can see sort of fingers extending in, sometimes not. And it's just rounded out into this kind of overall shape. But that's sort of the basic shortcut shape that you can think of for the deltoids, this big kind of shield. Um, if you have a person that has a lot of muscular development, of course, then it sticks out pretty significantly. On this one, on his uh, screen left arm, this one over here, you can actually see two parts of the deltoid. There we go. Just a little bit of shadow kind of cutting that off there. On the one that's facing us, you can sort of see the difference between this portion and these side portions, and those are the three different heads of the deltoid. Up on the top, usually there's a little bit of pinching. It sort of looks like a candy wrapper sometimes um, wrapping around, but we're surrounding the extent of the clavicle. So the, the topmost nodule is gonna be the extent of the clavicle. We're kind of surrounding that. And so that little extent of the clavicle should be about here. And if you take a look closely at his clavicle, what you can see right now is that it's sort of doing this. So from this angle, we're kind of getting an inversion of that typical kind of bend for some reason, probably due to rotation or it may just be an optical illusion, okay? But that's what we are generally gonna think of as being the, the deltoid. Uh, you can see that it comes to sort of a point at the bottom here because it's kind of diving down into the structure of the arm to attach to the um, femur, or not the femur, the humerus, sorry, uh, between these two bulges, which are next to muscle groups, okay? Uh, any questions so far? Let's take a look really quick on our female model just to get a point of comparison. If I turn off the, there we go. I don't have to turn that off. We turn off the uh, overlay, then you can see there's clearly a big bulge where the deltoids are, right? So they're always gonna be pretty visible even on a person with less muscular development. Uh, but you might not get that shield shape necessarily being 100% obvious in this case. Um, we do know that this part right here, right, is going to be the pecs heading in towards the, um, I keep wanting to call it femur, humerus. And at this point, you can kind of see a sort of halftone shadow that's starting to find that that's where the deltoid is sitting. So keep in mind that some of these can trade off kind of subtly and it makes it a bit more difficult to tell the difference, but all that stuff is still happening in there. Let's fill that back in, okay. All right. So then we go to the upper arm, and we've got bicep, tricep, and brachialis. 
Most people are familiar with bicep, at least. Tricep is usually vaguely familiar. Brachialis, most people don't know what that is, okay? So bicep is the one we think about when we kind of flex our arms. It's the one on the top. Um, one single big bulge is usually the feel of that muscle, although it does have two sides to it in a person with a lot of muscular development and maybe low body fat you might end up seeing a kind of cleft in the middle of the bicep, but it's not very likely. Um, usually you're just gonna see one big sort of semi-blocky shape, okay? Kind of like that. So you could kind of think of it as like a lozenge or like, um, you know, like a candy or something like that. Um, you won't normally see it pinched down into the points on either end because it's going to be intercepted and wrapped around by other muscles by the time it gets to doing that. But I'm just pointing out that what it actually does is go underneath those muscles and attach to um, the muscles of the forearm, or sorry, the bones of the forearm. And up on the top, it does the same sort of thing. If you're looking at the bicep from the side and it is not being flexed, it tends to be flat on top. So you can have um, from the side, either this sort of raising up and plateau sort of shape, or if it's activated and shorter, then it can just bulge straight up like that. It's not unusual for it to bulge and flatten at the same time like this. So just keep in mind that all of those different shapes are normal. Okay. Any questions about that? <clears throat> and just keep erasing these as I go so I have scratch room to draw. Uh, I have a question about that, that hmm. pink Yeah, bicep. Mm -hmm. Does the bicep move when we like bend our arms? When you spin your arms? Uh, no, when you bend. When you when you flex your arm, as in, if your arm is extended out like this, right? Your bicep is not activated. When your arm rotates up like this, that is the muscle being activated. Oh. So it is a flexor muscle. Flexors contract the various parts of the body. Extensors um, straighten them. Okay? okay? Which is why this pose in particular is the show off the bicep muscle pose, right? Flexing your arm together. Okay. Okay? So the opposite of that one then would be the tricep and that's on the back of the arm. So that's this green one back here and also over here. Since this one is responsible for extending the forearm, this one activates when your arm is straighter, okay? It doesn't change shape quite as much, at least visibly. So here we've got one where he's just lifting up this weight and the tricep looks virtually the same as the one on the opposite side, which could be activated right now and is uh, helping him to extend his arm downward. I'm not really sure if that is the flexed position of the tricep because he does have a weight in that hand, so he could just be holding it down. But when the um, tricep is flexed, you'll tend to see the mass move upward towards the top and bulge a little bit more. And when it's relaxed, you'll tend to see it flatten down a little bit more and not quite be as bulged, okay? The tricep's kind of interesting. I don't really have a good angle on it here, but it's sort of a horseshoe shape. So on the back of the arm, if you just kind of draw a big horseshoe shape with a lot of mass up near the top and not nearly as much near the bottom, you can think of this as like a scallop um, or a horseshoe, kind of like that, but most of the mass is right up here at the top, okay? Um, you've also got this kind of secondary bulge down the, the bottom of it which goes all the way down to wrap around the elbow bone. So a lot of that is fascia or you know tendon, what have you. But there's this little secondary section of bulge about in this area that you will oftentimes see in profile. A little bit harder to render from straight on though. But this does come all the way around and wrap around the elbow down here. Any questions so far? Here you can see rendered on our female. 
So primary bulge here, secondary smaller one down here, wrapping all the way around the elbow. And although I'm drawing it sort of rotating back like this at this point, this muscle actually does dive in and go and attach to um, various different parts of the skeletal structure, but the visible part sort of ends there and creates such a strong horseshoe shape that it's better to think about it this way for superficial purposes. No questions or anything? I take it from what you're showing, you don't want us to differentiate between the different heads of if, deltoids and arms? If you are aware of that and you want to show that on the surface, go nuts. But I'm not going to require that. Okay. We're keeping it all a lot simpler and it will become abundantly clear why when we look at the muscles of the forearm because they are freaking nuts. <laughs> All right, so if you're looking at the outside surface of the upper arm, right, the outside surface, then we have one additional muscle between the two um, muscles that we just covered, and that's the uh, brachialis, okay? So the brachialis right here, partially responsible for stabilizing, partially responsible for twisting, partially responsible for lifting, um, but it occupies this kind of channel between those two muscles. I looked around a little bit to see, was there a muscle specifically dedicated to the inside portion? And I did not find one. Um, there are lots of other muscles all over the place that are more minor, more um, subdermal muscles. But as far as a major one or one that contributes to shaping, I did not see one for the inner surface. And so I can only assume that that is just the bicep, tricep, and just kind of fascia, you know, loose connective tissue and essentially where the bone could be felt. Um, even when I'm feeling on my own arm doing the same sort of thing, it's a little bit creepy, but I can kind of feel the bone between those two muscles and especially underneath the bicep. So oh, be aware of that. If we're looking at the inner surface, then really the, the contributors are gonna be how bulged is the tricep uh, horseshoe shape and how bulged is the bicep shape but beyond that, there's not a whole lot until you start letting the other muscles contribute, such as the pecs, which will dive in there, and the deltoid, which will contribute as well. There's one near the armpit, but it's pretty rare to see. Yeah. The of the arm. Yeah, and we might as well just think about it as being these two, right? The, the latissimus and the pecs. But yeah, just not one that is contributing to your you know, overall sense of, of sculpture, which is what we're concerned about. Uh, on the outside, however, you really can see this one, uh, the brach uh, brachialis. It is pretty easy to see on people with a low body fat ratio, on people who are um, strong but do not have, don't really care about like body fat, it's really hard to see. Even on this guy who appears to be like model fit, it's hard to pick out. Like, can you see it there? It's pretty tough. Right, but it's in there. Okay. All right, so those are the three for the upper arm. Uh, any questions about those? Good so far. Okay. So the the brachialis would be on the side. It is on the out facing side of the upper arm. Okay. So on the in-facing side, there, there isn't really very much. It's either flat or bulged on top and bottom only because of the two neighboring muscles. On the outer surface, though, this additional muscle contributes to a three-bump shape. Okay, and it connects to the, to the top muscle, or it just goes, it goes over it? It goes underneath the deltoid, between the bicep and tricep, and then it goes underneath the next sets of muscles that we're going to explore that go down the forearm. Okay. So it's, so yeah, it's, it's literally only visible right there. Okay. And when we look at a person wrapped in skin, hardly visible at all, in fact. And I think she's got her arms the wrong way to be able to see it, but you get the idea. All right, then before we look at the muscles of the forearm, let's take a moment to look at the bones because they start to have a major contributing factor in the shaping of the elbow. Um, as we travel down the humerus, 
the sides of the humerus, left and right, contribute to the shape of the elbow. So here, I've got one spot where we would be able to see humerus sort of shaping the surface right about there. On the opposite side, it would go straight through and kind of point towards his rib cage. Uh, on the back, that is the ulna, um, which has a nodule on the back that contributes to the um, shield shape, similar to your kneecap. Um, but in this case, it would be like your elbow cap. Even though there, there is not a floating extra bone on your arm, it's the same sort of structural shape, okay? So down here where he's flexing, this would be the, the bulge on the ulna. And on the sides here, we would get the two heads of the uh, humerus going basically straight back at that point. On her, we are facing towards the head of the humerus right here. And then you can just see the nodule on the back of the ulna over on the side here. And I think it's basically the same thing on the left side. Let me turn off the tracing so that we can look at that more clearly. You can very clearly right here, that's it, see the head of the humerus. And right here, pretty clearly see the head of the ulna. Um, same thing on this side, we've got one of those bumps here, the other bump here, the third one hidden because it's behind the structure that we're looking at. On him, a little bit harder to see because he's actually got one of the muscle groups here sort of covering over the area where the, the near head of the humerus would be, but it's right underneath that area. And then this right here would be that sort of back nodule of the ulna. Okay, This one right here, back nodule of the ulna, side of the humerus would be right about here, but again, he's got some muscle sort of covering over that. At best, it would be all the way down here, but probably it's more like, yeah, I, I think it's probably right about there. A little harder to see though, because it's all kind of covered. All right, forearm. Forearm is where it's a little bit more confusing. Let me zoom out just a little bit. Um, to start off with, one of the easy ones to locate would be um, brachioradialis, because it's right underneath brachialis. Okay, brachialis sits on top. Brachioradialis is the very next one that goes down the forearm. So it starts right at the same spot. It's this green one that's sort of wrapping over top of it up in this area. And then it goes from that outer surface side to the thumb side of your wrist, okay? So if you hold out your hand, um, palm facing upward, palm facing upward, the two bones in your forearm are not crossed. They are perpendicular, okay? Or sorry, parallel, they're parallel. Um, so that would be the brachioradialis would go from that thumb side of your wrist to the outside of your um, outside of your elbow if you have your palm facing upward like that. Okay, they're on the same side together. In this case, this guy is twisting his wrist, so his wrist would actually face uh, this direction, or at least the bones would face that direction if he was untwisted. Um, but since he is twisting around this direction then it's going from this side, twisting around that side. That's what's happening with that green one, okay? On the opposite arm, he's actually doing that supination position where the palm would be facing inward, would be facing directly upward towards the shoulder. And so that means that the brachioradialis is in line on this one. So it's going outside, straight up that side of the wrist. Now, unfortunately, it's facing the wrong way, but it's still doing that sort of thing. Um, on her, she is rotating her wrist slightly as well. In order for these to be unrotated, they would have to face towards the bicep. And so she's rotated them 90 degrees outward. And so the brachio uh, brachioradialis is twisting a little bit from the backside forward in both cases, just a little bit. Okay. But it's going to occupy that inner surface each time, the thumb side of the wrist, all right? All right, so then we've got the extensors and the flexors. I want you to think about the concept of what an extensor and a flexor does. We're talking about fingers, okay? This is extensors of the fingers, flexors of the fingers, okay? Which way do your fingers bend towards 
the inside of your wrist or towards the outside of your wrist? Inside, they close. They, they curl in, right? So which one of these are you going to find on the side where your fingers curl in? Flexors. Uh, yes. So a flexor, flexing your fingers, is curling them inward. Okay, so that means that these yellow ones here, right, on this side, those are the flexors, okay, on your inside of your wrist. And you can see here, they basically cover that whole surface. They go all the way around until basically they encounter the ulna bone, which is just kind of sitting there, really. I mean, like I'm touching my own forearm right now to see, like, is there anything between my fingers, skin, and bone, and not really. So if you hold up your arm, and on your pinky side, right, run your fingers down from the nodule on your wrist on the pinky side, down along your arm to your elbow, it's just bone there. There's nothing. Okay, so that's, that's the ulna right there, just kind of on the surface, and it divides the extensors and flexors on that side. So the extensors go from the inner surfaces of your forearm all the way out to that bone. And then once that bone is, um, is present, all the extensors are gone. And then the flexors take over on the opposite side. So on this guy's right hand arm here, this is that bone going down this direction. We can just see one of the flexors visible behind it. And then the rest of these are flexors. Okay, let me turn off the tracing and show you one more time. So this is the bone area right here, slicing that area in half because this is the pinky side of the wrist, okay? And this is the thumb side of the wrist. Then the rest of these muscles in this area, everything except for that one, the brachioradialis, all of those, those are all flexors, okay? And they kind of wrap around a little bit like this, okay? This one extra one on the back here, that's an extensor. Or, yeah, an extensor. Okay. Uh, on the opposite side, we're looking at the, the pinky side of his arm, but he's also twisting it. Or no, he's, he's actually in line. So we should have it on this side as well, kind of running up this side. Let's see what I drew. Yeah, I did draw that. Although this level of bend over here, that could not possibly be the bone. That's got to be a extensor and so I probably put the wrong color on that one I'm thinking about that now it's like there's no way that that's the bone there it's too bendy so probably that's an extensor and then right in that cleft is where the actual bone is gonna be okay so right in this area cool let's take a look at our female model so we're mostly looking at the flexors because she's showing us the insides of her wrist. Um, I don't think any extensors are really visible from this angle at all, although we do have the brachioradialis. Um, I did color one little bit in the middle pink because that is a significant, um, a significant structure. That's not the pronator terrace. I don't know why I didn't write it down, but that is the one of the central tendons of the flexors of the wrist is just very, very visible in the center of the wrist just about all the time. And so I colored that in pink just to remind me to mention it, that if you're, you're drawing a wrist, usually you're gonna have one or two of these kind of visible. Usually that one is the most visible because it stands out more than anything else um, and just kind of creates a large surface on the inside of your wrist. Uh, if you look at your own wrist, relax your hand, and then flex your fingers upward without moving your palm. Just flex your fingers like you're making kind of like a tiger claw. You'll see that that tendon stands up pretty, pretty high, but there's also a second one next to it, which is one of the other fingers. Uh, if you start to play your fingers um, in that kind of tiger, you know, claw kind of configuration and start to like play your fingers up and down, you can see each one of the individual tendons start to move as well. Um, something I like to do when we're live in a classroom is have people relax their forearm and then press 
on the inner surface of their forearm with their thumb and you can make your fingers twitch and uh, flex inward by doing that because all of those muscles are somewhere over here along this area. And so it's a really cool kind of thing, even though it's a little bit gross. Okay, uh, we do have one more though. Okay, so the last one, pronator teres, which is one of the two muscles that envelops the bicep, okay? So as the bicep comes down towards the forearm, it's wrapped by two different muscles. One of them is the brachioradialis, so that's the green one, which is on the um, thumb side, as we discussed. Wait, yep, thumb side. And the other one, pronator teres, sort of wraps around and completes that from the opposite side. So technically part of the um, flexors group, because it is on the inside, um, it's special because it creates this sort of wrapping kind of action. So if we've got the bicep like this, we're looking directly down the arm. One set of muscles is coming around like this. The other set of muscles is coming around like this and wrapping around. Okay, kind of like that. Like a knot. Uh, sort of, yeah. Or like a, like a, a scarf around a neck, kind of like this. So kind of wrapping around, even though it does not do this, right? <laughs> but, but yeah, sort of enveloping it, wrapping it. You have to do that. <laughs> okay, and it's a very, very um, pronounced shape that you just about always get there. Um, they also kind of contribute to the cleft shape of the forearm um, on the inner surface. To simplify, if you're looking at the inner surface of the forearm, I guess I'll just draw it here. We've got a kind of bulging on the sides and narrowing towards the wrist, sort of like that. But to really simplify this, if you've got someone with a lot of muscular development, you're gonna get one big bulge on one side, one big bulge on the other side, and a small cleft in the middle, and that's about it, okay? Unless they have individually developed all of these muscles to stand out, you're gonna get that sort of feature where one part of this is bulging out here, one part of it is bulging out here, and then it comes down to the relatively boxy shape of the wrist down there. So you can sort of think of it like as a heart or sort of elongated uh, heart shape. Okay, yeah, chicken leg. And those, those uh, muscles are the ones that contribute to that shape. Okay. All right, let's see, do I have pronator teres on hers? Yeah, I figured it must be in there, but it's, it's impossible to see. She doesn't have enough muscular development for me to really spot that, but it must be in there. Okay. Cool. Questions? Confusions? Okay. I do have a couple other models lower down, which we can try to identify these shapes with this guy and her. Okay. Both of them fairly athletic. It tends to be a bit easier if you've got someone with very low body fat, you know, to do this sort of thing with. But I've got some examples later, um, strong man in particular, where it's very, very obvious um, that their muscular development is there, but it's also covered in a layer of fat and skin. And so it's not so obvious where all those individual shapes are. All right. Can you guys see clearly where the deltoid is on this guy? And this is kind of a crappy picture, but we'll try anyway. Can you guys clearly see the deltoid? <laughs> where? Uh, on the right, the light is hitting it. Right. Yeah, and then on the left, it's that little divot. Oh, uh, lower. Oh, you're going to say that? I'm not so sure about that part. That could be partially deltoid, partially pecs kind of bulging that out. I know we've got this cleft here to show like the pecs are already going down underneath. Um, probably you're right and that that is still deltoid, but it's a little bit odd that it be this flared out. So he may have really, really worked on those delts a lot and now they're just this long. Or this could be the deltoid and that could be some other feature like pecs or the end of the bicep or something that's hard to spot. I think you pro you probably got it right that that's going to be deltoid though. Okay, you can see this characteristic rounding on the top of the deltoid 
one of the easiest ways to spot it where it connects to the rest of the body. It tends to kind of create a cleft all of its very own. Um, we can sort of see the difference, I think, between heads right here. There was a little bit of a cleft there, so we could have that happening, but based on the size of this, it suggests that the third head of the, the deltoid would be like behind here somewhere, unless that arm is rotated in a really weird way that's kind of hard to grasp, but somewhere in this region, this is deltoid, okay? You guys are able to recognize this one. What's that one? Traps. Traps, right? So trapezius coming up along the back of the neck, sort of trading off here. Usually we've got kind of a um, shallow divot area right in the middle here. This structure, what's this structure? Clavicle. Clavicle. I think Robert's the only one playing along. <laughs> yeah, suprasternal notch, clavicle. Okay, suggesting that it should go like that or something, but I think maybe his uh, muscular development is being misleading here because we can see that the place where the top of the deltoid is terminating is about here. If I draw a straight line, right, we can see that there's some bulging upward. So what's going on with the clavicle? It may be doing something like this underneath all of that, kind of a flattened kind of stair stepping. It's a little bit hard to tell, but right now we're kind of just seeing pecs, I think. So obviously this would be pecs heading up in this direction. We're getting kind of a little bit of, of pinching underneath here, which would be pretty typical, okay? And we can't really see the rest behind. So we've got pecs here, diving up here, attached, mm, hard to tell on the top, but about there, I believe, okay? Nice big cleft right here to show where the deltoid is connecting to the clavicle. We've got traps coming up that way. Right, and then of course all the stuff going on with the, the neck and the sternocleidomastoids. Okay. All right. Hopefully you can see bicep on this guy. He's got enough of them. All right. Right here. Hard to see where that shadow is hitting his torso and where it's actually his muscle. I would expect it to be more like this, actually rather than coming all the way down here. I mean, look at what happens when I draw it that way. Does that look plausible to you as opposed to this? Whoops. As opposed to that. You guys see the difference in what I drew? Yeah, that first one you drew connected lower down. It just didn't seem reasonable, right? Now this one seems more reasonable. Okay, so that's gonna be our bicep, right? Right in this area. And you can kind of see it start to interact with, I wanna say that this is brachialis right here, but... I think that's the tricep, because yeah. to the right of it, it starts to flatten out where the fascia is. We've got this, there's also this back here. So he's obviously got a lot of muscular development. It's starting to get kind of hard to tell the difference between them because, well, one, this picture is kind of low quality. Um, for another, he's got a lot of muscular development. I'm tempted, though, to say that this is like brachialis, and it's just the most developed brachialis section I've ever seen because I can see two more structures back here, and that's consistent with, with tricep. Back structure is the long head, and then the one that you circled is brachialis, is the medial. It's the medial head. head. So we're talking about this happening instead. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Because right, right in the middle, if, yeah, you might have to uh, erase the brachialis stuff that you drew to see it, but right in the middle, you can see that horseshoe where it flattens out for the fascia of the Yeah, the right there, right? That's what you're seeing. And then this is the flat area in there. Okay, good. So then brachial is still unfortunately not very visible. I mean, I guess this area, that is consistent enough. We are sort of seeing a half tone coming up in that area right there. So that would create it somewhere in this region, 
So if we start to add a little bit of dimension so we can kind of see, so there's deltoid as well as this portion down here. This would sort of be brachialis. This, we've got a lot of stuff going on to show that that's uh, tricep. And technically would come down a little yeah, bit further. Missing that bottom part because of the lighting and the white light. Yeah, there's some sort of highlight happening, but it's it's gonna come down all the way around the elbow, like that fascia goes all the way down to there. And not really sure where this one ends because the forearm muscles are gonna start picking that up, but kind of this is sort of the structure that we're seeing here. Okay. Briefly on the opposite side, I mean bicep is fairly obvious here, but this one kind of losing it in the lighting likely to be tricep even though it's so so turning around that form so much at an angle i would expect something like this is what i'm saying something like that and that brachialis is going to be somewhere in the middle here kind of squeezed between the two so probably something like that that's what i would expect to see all right, so then this nodule, right, would be the um, the knob on the back of the ulna. What was that name? Olacranon is the name of that. Um, knob on the back of the ulna is good enough for me. So that would be the knob on the back of the ulna. On the sides, though, I know that this egg-shaped one is an actual muscle, but it's a, it tends to be a fairly good indication of where the sides of the humerus are also. There's somewhere buried underneath that on both sides. But I know that that one in particular is another muscle group. You can actually see it over here. Um, the reason I know that is because on uh, baseball players, and if you were a kid in the 90s, then you might have seen the big like home run kind of competition between the baseball players. They always have a gigantically developed uh, one of those muscles that kind of looks like an egg on the side of their um, elbow area. So I know that that one is actual muscle, but tends to indicate where those heads are anyway. All right. So we're moving down the forearms then. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to get brachioradialis. Brachioradialis is going to be just underneath the brachialis, tends to be the one that makes this shape right here. Okay, so it's going to be this one that creates that strong linear right cut in front of the bicep. Okay, you can kind of see that. Uh, on the opposite side, I think that it's this one. I'm trying to see where does his wrist go. I'm pretty sure it's this one also. But it's a little harder to see on that side. Something like something like that one anyway. Okay. Then we've got the extensors, which are on the outside surface of the arm. We have to kind of figure out where is the end of the extensors, where is it going to um, turn into the bone. I think that bone cleft is this one right here. So going from the elbow, it looks pretty direct to me that that right there is probably going to be the part that's going to be the bone. The rest of those then are going to be the extensors and they sort of wrap around, um, they kind of follow a little bit the, the kind of pattern of the brachioradialis. but depending on the angle, they might be flat or they might wrap around. So we'll say that these, right, these here are those extensors, okay, something like that. And that this part right here, that's gonna be the one part that's bone. And we do have a little bit of flexor visible just beyond that, right there. Okay, a little bit of flexor. You can see we're on thumb side here. Um, we didn't talk about the knobs on the end of the wrist yet, but if you look at your own wrist, you may have um, really pronounced knobs for each one of those two bones, or they might be a little bit more um, subtle. Um, one of them is gonna be radius, one of them is gonna be ulna. The radius is the one on the thumb side. So if you kind of feel on that side of your wrist, the inner side of your wrist, you may feel a flat kind of boxy structure. On the outside, the ulna, that one tends to be more developed and a little bit more obvious, and it's on the pinky side of the wrist. So if we take a look at his hand. This is the thumb side. One of those two structures is right here, the square one. The opposite side, here's the round one, and you can just see that on him. 
Uh, you can actually see it pretty well on his other wrist. This is the pinky side. So that's one of the two skeletal structures. The other one, the square one, would be on this side. You can kind of think of the entire wrist as being kind of a big square. Just know that if you see one big pronounced knot, that's probably the pinky side of the wrist. Okay. All right, so we've got um, flexors and extensors on this side, as well as identifying where the bone is likely to be. That's just about all we need for that one. Uh, on this side, we can see the flexors. The flexors create a relatively flat um, shape right here in the inside of the forearm, with the exception that it does cleft um, if you've got more muscular development. So it could be completely flat like this, or you could get a cleft, something like that, if the person is very, very strong in flexing that area. Um, on him, surprisingly, I don't really see that cleft. I just see it flat. So it's possible that on him, that area is flat. Not sure. Or, we're, you know what, I think we're just looking at the wrong side. Now that I'm looking at how his, how his wrist is rotated, I think that that cleft would be back here somewhere. So this is just one of the two sides. Um, so that means over on the opposite side, these are the extensors. You can sort of see they create this wrapping kind of shape. Okay. Cool. Any questions about that? No? Everybody still conscious? Yes. Marco? 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 Well, I know you're conscious. You're the only one talking. <laughs> I can say it in like seven different places if it makes you feel better. That would if I don't look at the, the green circle highlighting on Discord. I will pretend that all of you guys are just wrapped with attention and totally into this because it'll make me feel good. All right. Too busy, yeah. What? <laughs> uh, we've got deltoid right here. Um, I picked her because she's actually got good muscle tone, but very little body fat and very little bulge on those muscles. So they're still pretty easy to identify for the most part, but they're not exaggerated at all. So it's a little bit harder to tell. By the way, one of the, the key structures differentiating in armpit, um, female from male, is often what breast tissue does to this line in particular. Uh, on men, this line is just gonna be completely straight. On women, you're gonna have one, two angles, sometimes even a third angle like that. So just keep that in mind if you're drawing the difference between the two. Uh, we do have bicep. Here we can kind of see the flat structure of the bicep rather than the uh, bulging shape over here. We can actually see pretty clearly, there it is, even the tendon heading towards the other bone. And here it goes underneath the deltoid. And actually I think that would be, that's probably pecs right there first, and then deltoid on top. One question. Yeah. Uh, when we draw the biceps, uh, do we draw that like potato shape? Um, or and, and add the, the points of where it dives into? Or is it one big shape or? The, the points where it dives into are only relevant if you can see them. So in this oh. case, you can see them, right? On this guy, you can actually see them sometimes. So the reason it's going this direction is because that's where the attachment of that side of the head of the, bice of the bicep is. Um, keep it in mind, essentially. When you need to explain what you're seeing, when you need to exaggerate it, when you need to add more clarity, that's why we want to know where those tendons go. Okay, so on her, we've got this deltoid kind of wrapping around the backhand side and trading off with what I assume to be um, some of the pec muscles coming down this direction. They're gonna kind of cross over in this direction. So probably we're getting kind of a double effect there. But you can see there's this cleft right here. So we can actually find two parts of the deltoid right there, one, two heads, and the third one is gonna be behind, excuse me. Uh, we've got a very, very flat tricep, okay? This part is more bulged. This part is the secondary kind of bulge. You're probably not gonna see the horseshoe shape on someone with um, this level of muscular development, but it would start to appear the more these two sides inflate, okay? But right now it's just kind of this big basic bending shape. Um, if you have to, 
um, just trying to draw it as a single curve. Keep the curve higher up on the arm for the tricep and keep it lower down the arm for the bicep. And that will tend to make it look more correct. Okay. So same thing on the opposite side. Here is deltoid. Okay. And then tricep is, I guess that, it's really, really hard to spot because there's nothing happening there. Um, brachioradialis would be between the two, but again, like it's all almost completely smooth. So it's really hard to spot anything, uh, but we can see a cleft happening here. So that's gonna be the end of the bicep at the very least. Right. Here again, we've got the olecranon, which is the end of the humerus, or sorry, that's the end of the ulna, the end of the humerus, the two heads of the humerus, one here, which we can actually see pretty clearly. Um, here is the olecranon again, one of the heads of the humerus right here, okay, creating that elbow shape. Uh, then going down the forearm for the bone. Let me make sure I remember which side we're looking at for that bone. One Pinky question. side. Yeah. Just, just so I have it, I, I have it in my mind. Mm -hmm. The ulna is the bone that goes down the forearm. And the... There you go. Okay, perfect. Ulna goes from... So ulna goes from elbow to pinky. Radius goes from the inner portion of the elbow to the thumb. So if you want to think of one of them as your forearm bone, it's going to be the ulna because that's the one that you can feel when you bend your arm and like put your hand up to the outside of it. The radius, you can't really feel unless you're squeezing the entire thing or tracking from your thumb up the, up the side of the arm. There tends to be more meat on the, on the um, radius side and there's, there's literally none on the ulna side when you reach the ulna. Okay, I just wanted to have that mentally in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now we're looking for forearm. So let's see here. Um, we know that these are going to be our extensors on the back of the forearm. Um, the question is about the other two. So. Brachialis would go straight down this. Brachioradialis probably going to be this first one here, which is creating this kind of bulge on the side inner forearm. The rest of them, some sort of extensors, but very hard to spot. Uh, mostly flat. I will say that probably the bone is somewhere in this area. This might be a flexor on the back here. The rest of them are just kind of cascading around and attaching to the wrist. Okay, Best guess there. Um, this is pinky side, so here's the nodule for the ulna down by, is that the pinky? Yeah, that's the pinky side. And then on the thumb side over here, that's going to be the uh, other side of the, the wrist. Over on this side again, so pinky side, so that will be the nodule for the end of the ulna right there. Um, probably going to have that bone right about there. Yeah, I think so. Somewhere in that this could be no that's all got to be that's all got to be extensors i think pretty sure i'm trying to like figure it out from my own arm so that is yeah i think all of those got to be extensors so flexors over here we're on the pinky side so which one of the two is that pronator so yeah, so we're probably looking at the pronator terrace is going to be wrapping around this direction, but very, very hard to spot. Practically impossible in this case, because there's just no, no muscle development happening. But it'll happen from about this nodule up. So it could be partially responsible for this half tone shape in here. But I know that it was so sharp, it's got to be bone there. I mean, that's, it's a very square shape. And if you have, you know, female figures like this, do your best, identify the ones you can find, know that the forearm is completely made up of um, extensors and flexors. So at least get them on the correct side. Okay, beyond that, there it's a big tangle. So just do your best. I would say the most important structures on the forearm would be the two muscles that wrap around the bicep. And then also where is that bony structure? 
right? The one that goes from pinky to elbow, because that one is going to be one of the few sharp areas on the forearm. Okay. Any questions? You guys want to look at some case studies? Let's look at him. Okay. Pick this guy because he was folding his arms, which ends up being very interesting, I think, the way that all of these different structures interlock and interact. Um, drawing and animating folded arms is one of the more challenging things that you can do. But you can kind of see a lot of stuff going on in the forearms in particular because he's got a level of tension here that's allowing us to see different individual muscles. Let me zoom in there. Okay. So that in particular, we can see a number of different flexor groups, or sorry, those would be extensors. As you can see that the palm is facing upward here. So we're on the back of the forearm. Bicep, obvious, tricep, or sorry, um, deltoid, pretty obvious, tricep, you can see the bulge happening right here, okay, extending all the way down to the elbow. Elbow has a really nice clear definition here. You can just about see the different skeletal shapes right through the skin right there. So that's cool. Over on the opposite side, it's kind of blocked a bit by this like watermark, but this one, right, that's going to be the ulna shape. And then this one here, that's going to be part of the humerus. Right. Kind of cool to see how the wrapping takes place. Like here, we've got a sort of cleft happening before the fingers extend up behind this round shape of the form. But remember that all this just needs to be basic tubes first in order to get this definition working properly before you add those muscle structures in. All right, any questions about this guy? Cool. Let's take a look at some more. I picked a number of gymnasts because they're undergoing extreme stress and tension with what they're doing. So here he's supporting himself on these two rings supported by straps, right? Which is a very, very difficult thing to do. So his triceps in particular are working very hard to keep his arm straight, but also the just about every muscle group in fact is sort of stabilizing. So he doesn't want to bend his arms. He doesn't want to hyperextend and break his joints. He doesn't want to twist very much. And so we've got lots and lots of muscle stress, which makes all of these parts stand out like crazy. Um, notice the concavity in his elbow, right? He's got kind of a hyperextending thing going on here, but you get this characteristic dimpling on the elbow when you have a really tense hyperextended uh, elbow the the center part of it right would be the bony parts the sides of it are sort of created by the um one side is the the head of the the humerus the other side would be probably brachioradialis yeah i'm pretty sure it's brachioradialis on the other side because i don't think both of them are, are kind of visible from the outside at least although i think that one right there is probably head of the humerus um you can see this almost like hexagon shape for the bicep and these two areas left and right that are creating those clefts into which the bicep is going underneath. So it's really cool to see someone under this much stress which shows all of this muscular development. Another good thing about an athlete is their muscles all functional, not cosmetic. And so you know that this is a person who is very strong in doing these things the natural way. So if you're character was like a warrior or a dancer or something like that, it would be more like this and less like the cosmetic bodybuilders that we see. Cool, huh? Oh, check this out. That right there, that is tricep. Okay, kind of see that horseshoe shape? Here's the flat section. 
just after. Okay. That is also tricep. We're just looking from the opposite side. Um, here we've got a female bodybuilder. So here's a person with a lot of tone and very little bulk. So another way to kind of see and showcase these various muscles. Deltoid, obvious, you know, always very easy to spot. You can actually see pretty good triceps on her as well. Here's the flat portion. Here's one of the heads of the triceps beginning that horseshoe shape. Um, biceps don't have a ton of muscular development, but they're definitely present. You can see that they have a lot of tone, okay? Going down the form, we're on the thumb side. So the thumb side is gonna have pronator terrace and then the extensors along the back. Um, pronator terrace on this side as well, thumb side. Um, I don't think we're seeing, or actually, no, I had it wrong. That's brachioradialis on the thumb side. Uh, pronator terrace is on the other side. Sorry. <laughs> Every time the, the forearm rotates, I get lost and it's really hard to keep track. Um, all of these other little highlights and shadows and stuff, most of that's veins. Um, you can tell that this person is a bodybuilder because they tend to do that dehydrating thing where you, all their veins stand out and all of the muscles can be picked out individually. That's a very unhealthy thing to do, but if you're a bodybuilder, it makes it look pretty spectacular, so that's why they do it. Um, here on the pinky side, we can see the end of the ulna, end of the ulna right here. Here's the knob on the end of the radius on the inside, creating that square shape of the forearm. see uh, this guy um, I believe Olympian I have a few of him let's see I believe that's him that's him probably that as well although I didn't notice how low quality the picture was when I downloaded it unfortunately um, this one in particular look at the the striations in his muscle it almost looks like a, a model or clay or something but this is one of the hardest actions to execute you know, with your body, as far as your upper body is concerned, um, called the Iron Cross. He's suspended there through muscular, you know, exertion only. Like he's off the ground, the rings are held out arm's length, and he's not falling down. So a ton of muscular stress here. And you can see it kind of written all over his face, but also the fact that you can see almost every fiber of the muscles really fascinating and then here he is doing just kind of like a pose so you can kind of see the different shapes of these various muscles on his upper and lower arms this one looks really really odd but hyper extended this is kind of what you would expect that's all bicep and that's tricep down there and he's got very very strong both because you've got to use both when you're uh, you know, flipping yourself around up in the air and, you know, suspending yourself. Cool. Take a look at this one, even though it's kind of low quality, the same sort of iron cross action from a different angle. We've got a model here. Okay, They're actually a pretty reasonable um, level of body fat as well rather than being like the super skinny kind of model that we typically see. Uh, so you can pretty clearly pick out bicep and the triangular shape as it goes between the clefts in the forearm. Over on this side, even more obvious, the clefts between the two sides of the forearm. We're on the thumb side. And so that's the radius, right? Radius, ulna being on the pinky side can't really see it from either one of these angles. Actually, we can see the head of the ulna right there. Okay. So these are flexors on the inside, generally creating two groups like that, the cleft in the middle, extensors on the back. Okay. Um, this is uh, one of those strongman competition guys. Um, I'm not sure why he's so veiny, a little bit weird, but um, this is one of the characteristic shapes that you get for very, very strong, um, larger males. You get this extra bulge on the inside, um, thumb side of the elbow. So that's going to be 
It's probably Brachioradialis. I think it must be Brachioradialis. Okay, Brachioradialis, although there is one extra muscle here, this whole structure I'm going to call Brachioradialis, though. You can even, even with this guy, as strong as he is, this shadow right here, this straight line going right to that nodule, that's the bone. You can still see the bone even through this much mass. It's pretty amazing. Oh, just a different angle of that same guy, arms up this time. Um, I, I chose this one because it kind of shows the cleft between bicep and tricep. So on the underside of the arm, the inner side of the arm, how there's virtually nothing there. The bicep, tricep can kind of just run up against each other. You don't even really have bone access there unless you really push your fingers in underneath that. And another strongman competition guy, just because it's so smoothed out all of these different surface features, but they're all clearly visible. He's actually lifting that right now, so they're activated too, which is a little bit hard to tell on a guy like this because they're already bulging. Okay. And here he's flexing. <laughs> uh, here's, by contrast, a model who has good muscular development, low level of body fat compared to this guy, high level of body fat, high level of muscular development, um, huge difference between these two and you can kind of imagine assigning like character archetypes to these kind of body structures right this person's obviously going to be very much about force and brutality and this person I don't know more about like acrobatics and finesse but you can go all the way down to the feminine structures and they are you know just as as exercised right they're still doing things probably more agility kind of base things rather than force, but they've still got muscular development too. Okay. Questions. If there are none, then that's going to be it. The bone is only going to be very visible at the elbow, sometimes at the wrist. Yeah, so you still want to do the, single, the cylinder shape for the arm and then add the muscles on top? Correct. Anybody else? Do we have to draw the luminous head included? Mm, no. I don't think I did. What did I write in the assignment? I forget. I don't think I put that on there. Okay. It'd be good practice, but I don't think it's required for this. Um, thoracic mass is required because you need the rib cage, suprasternal notch clavicles, and possibly scapula, whichever side you're looking at. Basic arm tubes, indication of elbow joint, indication of radius and ulnus at wrist, depending on which one you can see. Basic hand indication. Just do your best for now. We're going to cover that in the last week. Um, and then here's the list of muscles and connected muscles. So no mention of Loomis head. Okay. But it's good practice. I won't tell you not to do it, only that you don't have to. Yep. All right, you guys, any other questions? When, um, arms. Yes. A pair. Create 20 drawings of the arms, include upper body construction and connected muscles. So are we talking about 10 people or 20 people? Is that the question? Yeah. 10 people if you draw both arms. Cool. Cool. More questions? No. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> That's it. Good night. Good night. Good night.